the last few years have been marked with clashes between left and right. I'm not talking about like Congress or something like that because that's just right and writer. What I'm talking about are like leftists in the street getting in fist fights with fascists. And while we might be inclined to think that this is some sort of a new phenomenon, it's really not and goes back a lot further than you think. You might have heard about the whole force the vote and Jimmy Dore situation, which has torn, at least on Twitter, the left in twain. And while the left does its thing and tears itself apart, the right consolidates and coordinates and becomes more powerful and more dangerous. And you know what? We've seen this before too. So today we're gonna to talk about an incident that happened in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1979, where the division of the left and the unification of the right led to five people dying. By the way, there's no sponsor for this video and it is guaranteed to be demonetized so this video only exists because of the wonderful people at patreon.com slash stepbackhistory. Let's get into it. Hey folks, I'm Tristan and this is Step Back History. In the late 1970s, the Ku Klux Klan was going through some major changes. A new influential leader was rising the ranks by the name of David Duke, and he started a faction known as the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, or the KKKK. I've talked about them before in previous videos, but they were a group of the Klan that under David Duke had this interest in trying to have more mainstream respectability, to walk away from the open anti-blackness, which had by the 1970s gotten a little gauche, and move towards other subjects that are still racist, but have a more palatable flavor in American political discourse, like anti-immigration, anti-refugee, that kind of thing. And in this series, in the last several videos, we've talked about the stabbed in the back Vietnam War narrative. And the Ku Klux Klan sort of began with a different stab in the back narrative. It's very invested in what's called the Lost Cause. The Lost Cause is a historical myth about what the Civil War was fought over, specifically trying to reframe the fight as not about slavery, but about states' rights. <laughs> and the idea that the Confederacy losing was more of an honorable lost revolution rather than a sort of grasp onto the power of the slave holding entrenched elite. But this isn't a Civil War video, so we're not gonna go much deeper than that. But let's just say that it provided a very similar narrative as the Vietnam Stab in the Back narrative, and the Klan explicitly tried to make this connection. There are pictures of Vietnam vets next to Confederate veterans and this whole attempt to connect the two stories, that the Vietnam stab in the back narrative is just the same as the Confederate lost cause story, which is true, but in that they're both myths. The Vietnam narrative and a growing panic about the civil rights movement and about immigration had led to a swell in membership in the Klan. In 1979, David Duke bragged that his membership doubled. Another thing that the Klan started to do at this time was make peace with a long-term potential ally that had one sticking point, and that was uh, neo-Nazis. The Klan, as it had existed in the late 70s, was run by a lot of World War II veterans who, you know, for very obvious reasons, had issues with Nazis. However, after World War II, neo-Nazis had become a large and entrenched part of the American far right. So the two of them trying to get together was fraught with challenge, but there was obviously an opportunity there. The two of them were able to come together over a single issue that was more palatable in the mainstream. It was still super racist, but they had plausible deniability. And that, of course, is anti-communism. I got so many nasty comments about that in my first video in the series. It is strange, isn't it, that all of the most strong anti-communist movements, especially military ones around the world, always seem to be associated with white supremacist colonies, supporting apartheid, supporting white minority rule, or, you know, just like, whatever you have, really. Our story begins in the town of China Grove, North Carolina, about 60 miles from the city of Greenboro, where the Klan, in this you know, growing membership, was trying to recruit by having a public screening 
of the infamous racist film Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation has an interesting role in the history of the Klan and American white supremacy and the history of cinema, so much so that I decided to break it off and do a video just about Birth of a Nation someday. But if you're really impatient, there is an episode of the podcast I Don't Speak German about this, and I'll put a link to that in the description. The public screening of Birth of a Nation was protested by a few local black civil rights activists, but primarily by a Maoist group known as the Communist Workers Party. The two groups together attempted to storm the community center that it was being hosted in and shut down the film. The police managed to stop them, but the threats and the attempt of uh, being attacked actually was rather reminiscent of a scene from Birth of a Nation. And so the Klan sort of tried to hop on that narrative and vowed revenge. Now, what is the Communist Workers' Party? The CWP is a Maoist organization, so a communist party that was trying to do a leftist revolution by violently overthrowing the government. But first, they had to organize the people. A lot of these people were white, educated activists who moved to Greensboro in order to organize the workplaces in the city and try to Know, make their vanguard party there. The reason they chose Greensboro is because it was a manufacturing town for textiles, and it had very low unionization rates and a high prevalence of a disease called brown lung disease, which occurs with people who work with cotton fibers. So the CWP's idea was to unionize these workplaces and use that as the seed of growing a communist revolution in America. They did work with the local black community. Some members of the local black community did join the CWP, but other members of the black community took up issue that they were causing confrontations with white supremacists in their neighborhoods and basically turning their you know, turf into a battlefield. But like many Maoists and leftists, the CWP believed that the right had to be confronted wherever it was and aggressively. As I mentioned, the Klan had been growing a lot in the 1970s. In 1975, the Klan boasted maybe about six and a half thousand members, but by 1979, they had as many as 10,000. As I mentioned earlier, they moved away from open segregationist talk to something that was more couched in anti-communism. This is a large part of how the Klan operates in the American South. There's this strong connection between things like communism and race mixing, labor rights, internationalism, and anti-imperialism. And all of these are threats to the 100% American way of life. And the Klan was able to capitalize on that. The mainstream press covered both groups. They wrote about them both as dangerous radicals, but they portrayed the communists as carpetbaggers from the north who were dangerous anarchists who were threatening to destroy everything, while the KKK were more thought of as misled local boys who were just trying to protect the status quo. But a much more sympathetic coverage. This is going to factor heavily a little bit later. Another thing that was growing in the 1970s, which the series is basically about, was the white power movement. The right was moving towards a greater emphasis on violence in order to enact the political change that they wanted, which started to dissolve the barriers between different factions. As I mentioned, the most famous being that of the neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. As Vietnam started to replace the Second World War as the dominant war narrative in America, the two were able to soften their differences with each other. They both saw anti-communism as a threat to white supremacy, so they were able to work together to fight it. And these weren't just strict political allegiances. The Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis started to grow very intimate connections. And I do mean intimate, like marriage, uh, common churches where many of the various rites of their lives are done. They would stay at each other's houses when they were going to rallies. They would take care of each other's kids. They'd go to the same weddings. They'd give money to each other. You name it, they worked together on everything. Meanwhile, the left, because of government infiltration and internal division, was splintering and fraying and falling apart. The government didn't have much of an interest in breaking up the organized far right, but they did have a very strong interest in breaking up the organized far left. This is why in America today, there's functionally 
no presence of the left in American politics. Just one example to show how divided they were, Greensboro had three leftist groups that were all trying to organize and unionize the different textile plants, and they competed against each other, sometimes getting into blows, and the CWP was just one of them. So not only was the CWP in the crosshairs of the Ku Klux Klan, but they had leftists in their city who could ostensibly have been allies that just weren't there. Nonetheless, with the rise of the KKK in Greensboro, the CWP announced it was going to host a Death to the Klan rally. The KKK was ready with its typical terrorism and, you know, intimidation. They started to litter the town with leaflets that showed a silhouetted figure being lynched, and they both started getting ready for what they knew was going to be a fairly violent clash at the rally. And because in America, the right has a more tight cultural embrace of guns and more of the paramilitary training and Vietnam veterans went towards the radical right than the radical left. The leftists prepared for this rally with helmets and clubs, you know, things like that. Some of them had pistols that they were just going to keep in their cars in case things got really bad. Meanwhile, the Klan and the Nazis getting ready had everything from brass knuckles to AR-180 semi-automatic assault rifles. They even got military munitions like tear gas canisters that you can't get publicly. That's because of a little bit of a trickle of weapons out of military depots and into the far right, which we're going to talk about in the next video in the series. Nobody on the right was having any second thoughts about the use of violence, while the left was a lot more divided when it came to whether or not to use violence. The event happened on November 3rd, 1979. The press showed up, the CWP held a rally at a black housing project where they shouted, you know, death to the Klan, your typical speakers and marches and, you know, children were there, all sorts of things. They even burned a Klansman in effigy. The police, who will become relevant kind of soon, were nowhere to be seen. They had established themselves, you know, to watch over the rally, but they were several blocks away. Meanwhile, the Klansmen and neo-Nazis were also getting ready to go. They put together a caravan with all of their cars driving in a line. They were ready to fight, and they were ready to kill. Well, by the time the Klan caravan left, it was generally understood that our plan was to provoke the communists and blacks and to fight it. Now that they'd be sure that when the fighting broke out that the Klan and the Nazis would win. We were prepared to win any physical confrontation between the two sides. And when the Klan arrived, shit, indeed, went down. As they arrived, the communists yelled, death to the Klan. The Klan responded with venomous racial slurs. They jeered at each other, they hit the cars, tension started to rise. And then the first shot started breaking out. Klan members started firing their guns into the air and shooting at other people's cars. Then at a major intersection, the Klan got out of their cars and started to get into a fist fight with the communists. The CWP was mostly focused on trying to get children out of the way. Uh, there were children at this rally and they were trying to whisk them away as fast as possible to get them out of the violent zone. Meanwhile, the KKK was interested in beating up communists and possibly even getting a few headshots. They started firing guns indiscriminately into the crowd. One woman who was eight months pregnant was knocked over because she had bird shot fired into her leg. Eventually in self-defense, one of the CWP members went to his car and got a shotgun and it turned into a firefight. As more CWP members went to go get their munitions, the Klan was firing indiscriminately into a crowd of people who were unarmed, or armed only with, like, batons and bats. People who were in that crowd reportedly saw that the Klan members and Nazis were m intentionally missing completely open shots against white protesters who had weapons in order to aim at black protesters who didn't have weapons. After three harrowing minutes, the Klan ran away, and the police, you know, in, you know, true form for the South, were able to arrive just after the Klan had gotten away. Jeez. Shucks. We'll have to catch them next time, boys. At the end of the day, five protesters were dead or mortally wounded. Cesar Sose, Mitchell Nathan, Jim Waller, Bill Sampson, and Sandy Smith. Seven more protesters and a single Klansman were injured. One protester suffered extensive brain damage, had to get massive surgeries, and uh, spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. This event got national press attention. The New York Times wrote about it. 
Jimmy Carter start an investigation into the Klan based on it. But sadly, about a week later, the Iran hostage crisis happened, and it quickly got off of the front page of the newspapers. The Greensboro Massacre did, however, energize the white power movement. Klan violence increased 450%. The murderers at their trial invoked the Vietnam War and anti-communism as a way to claim that they were doing some form of self-defense. At the trial for these killers, the use of jury dismissal resulted in an all-white, all-Christian, all-anti-communist jury. Remember how I talked about how there was uneven press coverage of the two groups? This is where things came into play in a big way. Because of the unfair press coverage between the two groups and local press, the trial turned very sympathetic for the murderers and started to heavily distrust the CWP. The local newspaper, the Greensboro Record, uh, tried to imply that the CWP members who died did so intentionally, that they went to the rally intending to die so that they could become martyrs to the cause. They also tried to employ some new forensics technology, this like sound wave technology to detect gunshots, which was untested and very, very inaccurate. But they used this in the court to try and make the claim that it was actually the communists that fired first. The jury heard nothing about important things like how the autopsy photos of the victims of the Greensboro massacre somehow leaked and the Klan was starting to use those photos as part of their recruitment. And so at the end of the day, all of the murderers were found not guilty. There was a civil suit that kind of won where they were given some money for damages by the you know murder of their significant others. Uh, something that the city of Greensboro paid and not the Klan. The Klan took this as tacit support of what they did, by the way. I mean, how could you blame them? Given how that trial ended up and given how even the civil suit ended up, how could the Klan respond to anything except that the state's behind you, please keep going, escalate this. This event unified the white power movement and did nothing for the left. The left continued to splinter. And even after this, the government continued to be more invested in destroying communist groups than fighting the Klan or neo-Nazi groups. Which I think takes us to the lessons of today, which is- Hey, uh, this is Tristan editing the film right now. And as I'm editing it on the afternoon of January 6th, uh, fascist far-right supporters of Donald Trump are uh, have literally broken into Congress, uh, broken into the Capitol building with basically no resistance from police officers who are there. Um, the next few minutes could be very scary, and I don't know what the end of this day is going to result in. I'm literally editing a video talking about how the government paid no attention to the far right focused on breaking up and attacking the left. And then, you know, for their negligence, we're literally seeing uh, the government being stormed in one of the most scary moments for American democracy in its entire lifetime. It just goes to show that, you know, a few days ago we were fighting about what, like, whether or not to force a Medicare for all vote. And you know, tearing each other apart over that. And now fascists are literally storming the government capitol building in Washington, D.C., right? I don't really know what to say. All I gotta say is now, if you care about justice, you gotta be out there. We gotta be out there confronting the right. Um, the Communist Workers Party in this story tried and some of them died, but um, when you don't show up to oppose them, bad things happen. So stay safe, friends.